Hello and welcome to Hackerang TV. A very good morning to everyone tuning in from the PT Pacific time zone. Good afternoon to those in the Eastern ET time zone and a wonderful evening to our friends in India in the IST and the APAC time zones. I'd like to start by saying successful enterprises these days are evolving into what we call as platform-based organizations. The notion of reinventing information technology infrastructure as a set of platforms that are open, elastic, and easy to manage is, a very, is very important today to secure an organization's future. As with any major transformation, it requires strong technology and engineering leadership, quality development teams, strong project management and communication, as well as value assurance. And that's precisely what we've planned for our discussion today. We're stoked to have with us today Vijay Gogineni, Vice President Associate Experience at ADP, which is a comprehensive global provider of cloud-based HCM solutions. Vijay is based in Atlanta, Georgia in the United States, and his early avatar used to be Chief Operating Officer at NYC Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Previously, Vijay has worked for over a decade at IBM while leading global teams in the design, development, and implementation of enterprise software. Vijay, welcome to Hackerang TV. Very, very happy to have you with us today. Thank you, Padal. Thanks for having me. Our next guest is uh, Hari Shankar Karnaniti. Hari is co-founder and CTO at Hackerank, which is the technology hiring platform that is the standard for assessing developer skills at over 2,000 plus companies around the world. Hackerank is backed by GM Equity, Kosla Ventures, Battery Ventures, and Y Combinator. Prior to Hackerank, Hari had had technology stints with IBM and Novell in Bangalore. Back in 2007, Hari was selected for Google Summer of Code under the Firefox organization. Hari then integrated Tinderbox with Firefox Build and automated testing of Firefox using LDTP. Pleased to have you with us as always, Hari. Glad you can join and thank you for joining in at 10.30 p.m. IST. This is 20 to 30 hours all the way from our office in Koramangla, Bangalore. Absolutely, Adil. This is my excuse to come to office. I uh, would not let that go. Uh, uh, and I'm happy to be here and looking forward for an exciting conversation. Absolutely, Hari. So now, ladies and gentlemen, that you've gotten introduced to our guests, time to get this conversation started. But before we dive in, if you have any questions you'd like to ask our guests, please comment wherever you're tuning in from. We're broadcasting live today on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Wherever you tune in from, if you just put in a comment on the post or as a reply, we'll be able to see your question or comment right here. I'll also be able to flash it on screen and ask that specific question to our guests. So please do comment and we're really looking forward to making this format interactive. In case you're on Twitter, please do tweet your questions to us with the hashtag, hashtag Hackerank TV. Again, the hashtag is hashtag Hackerank TV. Quite I a few have, comments have also started coming in. Sorry, Vijay, you were just saying? I do have a question. Uh, I'd like to know what Hari's secret is. At 10.30 in the night, he's looking as fresh, if not fresher <laughs> than I am, at uh, what is it, 1 p.m. in the U.S. So whatever he's can give me some of that. That's that's a quick nap before the call, Vijay. Uh <laughs> awesome. All right, so with that, I was just saying, there's a ton of comments already coming in. Uh, let me try and flash those on screen. Uh, Celestine says, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you too. Anthony, looks like you're also in the Eastern time zone. Very good afternoon to you too. Uh, Anjali, looks like you're in India. Thank you for joining in. So is Hadith. So is Shweta. And there are a bunch of you. So there is also somebody, again, from the Eastern time zone. Uh, that's Fajindra. Yeah, Fajindra. Thank you for tuning in. I'm glad you're kind of enjoying this conversation. So Janardana, uh, again, glad you're tuned in. And we're delighted that you were able to join in today. Pleased to have you. Uh, Israel, what a lovely name. You share a very popular name with this world. Again, welcome to this conversation. So all of you, like you see that, uh, you know, like I'm sharing, uh, I'll be able to share your comments exactly like I did on screen. If you're just able to reply in the form of a comment, wherever you're tuned in from. So for example, Joel is just wishing us a good afternoon from North Carolina. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome, Joel. We've got someone. 
uh, from Iran as well, right here. And that's Hadith. Hadith, good to see you. We've also got someone from Ohio. There you go. Hey, glad you could make it. Now, I'm going to continue flashing these on screen as and when y'all comment. So if you have any questions for Hari or Vijay, please feel free to send them in. And now that we are set, let's go ahead and get started. My first question is for Vijay. Vijay, I was doing my research and you know I've been interacting with you for a few months now. And I was trying to figure out what should be my first question to you. And I was doing tons of research on your profile on ADP. And then I came across this very interesting article um, on ADP's blog itself, in fact, which talked about upcoming evolutions in HR. And one of them was shift away from big data and towards what you called smart data because big data rarely offers meaningful insights. Could you please uh, talk to us about this? How do organizations decide which metrics qualify as smart data? Great, great question to, to start the show with. So at the end of the day, uh, what everybody's looking to do with data is to mine some useful information from that data so that they can make informed decisions as they're leading their organization. That, that's the whole role of data, right? So now with big data, which means there's just humongous amounts of data, but not just the amount, but it's the, the structure of the data, right? So it's not just structured data, it's unstructured, Twitter feeds, video feeds, blah, 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 X, Y, Z. When you have all this data, it's very hard to get lost in the forest of data. Uh, right. So what we mean by getting smart with data is don't chase after a thousand metrics. I think today's world in the HR world today, there's more than a thousand metrics that organizations uh, are either measuring or uh, going after in, time, in terms of attempting to measure. Right. So what we believe is at the end of the day, the enormous reams of data that you process when you make a decision, it has to be subjective, right? So for example, uh, if you're trying to um, identify your top performers, right? So it's down to a specific set of individuals and it's very subjective, right? So you can't paint that with a very broad brush. And, uh, and the products that we create and the, the behavior that we reinforce within ADP itself is we go after smart data points that help us inform in making good decisions. And I'll give you a couple examples of uh, such metrics um, that, that we both have productized in our data cloud product, as well as use uh, within, uh, within our roles within ADP as well, right? So uh, a few things like pay equity. I think uh, this is big in today's world. So uh, it'll. So we have a metric that we go after. So looking at all the data, we compare uh, pay equity against race, against gender, against ethnicity, and we tell you how your organization, especially your specific group of employees, is doing against the competition. Now, how do we benchmark this against the competition? You have to remember we process almost one in six uh, pay payrolls in the U.S., right? So we process more than a 700,000 uh, organizations uh, uh, payroll today. So, so we have access to a whole bunch of data across a whole variety of industries. So we can benchmark. So that's a very important smart data point that helps you address a very specific problem within your organization. If you look at uh, other smart metrics like turnover cost, like if somebody, if one of your employees were to leave, what's the cost of that action to your company against bringing somebody else in externally, uh, waiting for the, the onboarding time, retraining the employee and gaining the, the productivity that was lost, right? So we can benchmark that and we serve that up to you. So these are all very specific insights that we mine from data and we make it smart so that managers and practitioners can make informed decisions. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think uh, what I learned from that is the central theme being enabling and empowering people to take key decisions. Because I think in business, that's the secret, right? It's it's really about your decisions, when you take what you take. And you know, yeah, even Jeff Bezos says that his job is to take three to five high quality decisions in a day. And if technology and data can empower you to do that, 
it can just be so, so uh, phenomenal from a business success point of view. So like we see, we've got tons of people right here. It's, it's been truly a global audience. You've got people from Bangladesh. You've got people from UK. I mean, a lot of friends in India are up late and kind of interacting from India as well. But we've got people from Nigeria. We've got people from Nepal. We've got Iran coming in, Sri Lanka coming in. Bahrain is awake, uh, which is good to see. Uh, so is Kenya. It's it's phenomenal. There's also Indonesia. Uh, there's there's just so many, which is phenomenal to see. And again, the US, uh, a few I, I flashed uh, early as well, right? Uh, so you've got uh, somebody from LA, you've got the Eastern time zone. And then a very interesting comment coming in, Hari, particularly for you. Uh, and uh, I'm just kind of putting this on you. Uh, there's Bryce who says, any hacker rank employees in the chat want to give me a referral? <laughs> so, <laughs> Bryce, let me take a very shameless plug. If you can go to careers.hackerank.com, tons of open roles. We're hiring in the US. We're hiring remotely as well as we're hiring in India. So please do give us a shout out. We'd love to see how we can potentially help you. But yeah, of course, we're always up for it. But Hari, Hari any comments? Uh, absolutely. I would, I would love to talk to smart engineers. And, and, and that's one of the things I love in the hiring process as well. You do get a lot of... Uh, um, Joy, so my email address is Hari at HackerRank. It's simple, so you know, drop a note to me and I'd love to refer. Bryce, there you go. There's your opportunity, Hari at HackerRank.com. Uh, and then again, as I see, um, we, we've got another couple of interesting comments coming in. Not only we have Iran, we've got Arizona, we've got people from South America, Chile, um, and then we just have Vinicus from Brazil. Uh, Andre, who's coming from Spain, it's thank you guys. Thank you for tuning in. This is so much fun. We'll continue uh, to, you know, we've got Ethiopia. We've got Khaled, who's coming from Tunisia. I'm just having a blast. Uh, and then Siva actually says we all practice in Hackerang. And I'm glad to see that, Siva. Uh, thank you for sharing that. But on to that, keep your questions coming. Uh, keep uh, keep uh, the interaction going. If you have any questions for Hari or Vijay, kind of type it in. Uh, and I'll be able to definitely flash them on screen and we can take those questions. Um, and with that, let me move to my next question for Vijay. Vijay, ADP's adaptable technology platform is making HCM better for organizations. Uh, can you dive deeper into how features like being cloud native, low code, having a graph database, how are these affecting or improving your customer's experience compared to what we now call the traditional cloud? Okay. Uh, loaded question. Let me uh, let me uh, quickly paint the landscape for you. So, so the beauty of ADP is uh, we cover a broad spectrum of the HCM landscape, right? So, we serve uh, customers uh, with less than five, ten employees to multinational companies that have hundreds of thousands of employees that operate across the globe, and. Uh, our main goal at ADP is leveraging technology uh, with one key objective in mind. How do we not just improve, but radically change and uplift our clients' experience as they use our products? So I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, one simple example is we just introduced a new product in the small business market. So uh, that's less than traditionally less than 50, but usually it's anywhere from 10 to 20 employees. So it's a product that was built uh, straight up from scratch, uh, totally cloud native. Uh, it leverages GraphSQL and the latest and greatest of uh, tech stacks that anyone on this call can think about it. It has it all. I'm not going to do a deep dive uh, in into the tech stack. More importantly, what I want to focus on is the outcome that was achieved, right? So Role is now GA uh, in the US. Uh, if you guys want to check it out, uh, go to Role by ADP, like a drum roll or like rolling with. Uh, so Role by ADP.com. And the premise is uh, it's totally mobile first experience and uh, any payroll uh, practitioner, which is usually in the case of a small business, it's the owner, right? They don't have a staff that to run payroll, to run the business and so on and so forth. It's usually one person running the whole show and it takes them under a minute to process their payroll. And there's no complex UI uh, that they need to be trained on. There's no workflows, there's nothing. 
you literally open your app and you converse, right? So you just type a text saying, I want to process my payroll. And bam, it'll ask you a few questions and you're done, right? So the power of conversational AI and a whole lot of advanced behind the scenes tech stacks being leveraged to drastically change and uplift customer experience. And there's nothing like this in the market. And uh, we are usually the first in these sorts of things. And we are the first here as well. So that's in the small uh, uh, business segment. Definitely check it out. And uh, just to show you that we do cover the entire landscape, we have another product that was built ground up, totally cloud native, uh, and it's changing the enterprise HCM landscape. It's won a few awards already uh, and, and uh, slowly scaling up in terms of enterprise customers as well. And it's called Lithion. And again, Lithion is uh, the, the underlying premise of Lithion, as you said, Adil, is a GraphDB. And what we're doing here is we reimagined how uh, HCM applications built on traditional SQL databases uh, operate versus how the the work environment, how is how are companies working today, right? So there's dynamic teams, there's multi-team structures in place. And these are hardly supported, if not very hard uh, to manage in your traditional HCM applications. When we leverage technology like Graph, which I believe Workday does, uh, and we are the only other company that has reimagined this uh, HCM enterprise application leveraging this technology. We can build relationships. We can support dynamic teams. And it's it's not just a product, right? It's a platform where people can both internal and we have not yet exposed it to the external development landscape, but eventually we will. Right now, it's very easy for our teams to build micro apps and deploy them onto the platform so that the innovation that happens on the platform is unlimited, right? And it's agile, it's fast, it's easy, it's low code. All you have to do is build these mini apps, which you really don't have to code and deploy onto the platform. And, and I think that's the power of being in this industry for 70 years now, having the expertise of compliance and how to run payrolls across the entire globe. We can do things like this that others can't. Awesome, awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Vijay, Vijay, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, I think this is a very interesting question, given that we're talking about a platform-first approach. Very basic, but very smart one. What is platform-first approach? Uh, you, you want to take a very, very we one dig at that, uh, and then maybe once you share, maybe we can get Hari's comments as well. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can think of a simple analogy. Um, uh, I don't know how many people uh, are aware of either the Workday uh, or the Salesforce development clouds. It's creating a platform in the sense that uh, once we make the platform available to you, people can come in and write their own apps. I like think of it as building your own apps and deploying it onto the platform. Whereas in the past, typically these are all monolithic applications that whether it's an Oracle or EBS or, or an SAP, people can't contribute to it, right? So it's one big monolith that comes in its place and it gets deployed and you use it versus creating a platform and federating the development on top of the platform. And that's the capability that we're looking and, and that will build with Lifion is, is the power of federation where you now federate the ability to develop on top of the platform. Makes sense. Uh, Hari, your quick opinion uh, uh, in terms of Shivam's question, uh, what is platform first approach? Uh, yeah, if I have to define this, I think it goes along with the way what which I mentioned. Uh, one other way to look at it is like, look at the, the number of developers who are going to code for this. Is it just your organization or the entire world? So you are building the, the basic building block so that the rest of the world can build on top of this. Uh, that's So if, if the product can be enhanced only by your engineering team, uh, that's the, the old monolith way of building things. It, it's not bad, I would say, but it's not platform first. You, you can't have other developers coming and 
building on top of your product, extending your product and completely changing it the way you would have never imagined. Like, like you know, people customizing the workflows they want. Uh, and in a platform first approach, any developer in the world could build on top of your platform, change the way the product works, make money out of it too. Like they, they could completely have their living by having building these customizations and workflows on the, the core platform you've built. Uh, that's how I would define something which is probably non-platform and a platform first approach. All right. uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Hari. Vijay, you were saying something? No, I think I just noticed a question popping up on your screen by Joel. Uh, so I do uh, want to answer that. So right now, uh, we haven't opened up the platform for external development, but the ability to do that is there. And once we feel it's the right time to do that within the market, we'll just open it up. But for now, it's being federated within the ADP ecosystem. And that's a, that's also uh, something that, that needs to be understood. So the, the team that built the platform is not the team that is building uh, these mini apps that are... So give, let me give you an example of a mini app. So. Uh, how you onboard a person within uh, a country is not the exact same workflow, right? So there's country-specific laws and compliances that you need to take care of. And, and so uh, deploying a Lithion application in, in the U.S. may be different than deploying it in Australia, than in India. So the ability to, to federate that development so people can take the platform and make those localizations or those config changes or building out mini apps specific to uh, specific geographies or specific customers, that ability exists because it's a platform first approach, right? So that's happening within the ADP ecosystem where there's a platform team and then there's these federated teams that are now building applications on top, these mini apps on top of the platform and deploying them across the globe. Got it, got it. Thank you uh, for clarifying, Joe. Uh, Joel, I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, fun question from Kapil Sony. Are we only taking questions from LinkedIn? No, we're taking questions from all platforms. YouTube included, Twitter included, Facebook included. So wherever you are from, we will go ahead and take those questions. Hari, I know you've got a ton of questions lined up for Vijay, but there was uh, one more audience question, if I have your permission, that I think we can take. Uh, before we kind of jump into your segment. So Andreas has this question, uh, Vijay, and he says, hello from Buenos Aires. What if you didn't start with a platform first approach? What would be the key steps to transition to a platform first approach? Because I think this is a very interesting question, both yeah. in the enterprise world and in the startup world, because you start with an ideology, you start with a bent of mind, but suddenly now you're saying, oh my God, I need to move to platforms. So what's, uh, how, do we, how do we decipher an answer to this? I think it's trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, right? So uh, that 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 would be my answer to this is when you go the traditional approach and try to build a monolith, it's very hard. I don't, I haven't attempted it. I, I don't know that others have, but I feel, I feel that it's extremely difficult uh, to manage uh, and, and the control, like what's going on within your application when you federate out something there there's simple technological challenges and there's more complex how do you manage that whole effort uh versus having taking a platform first approach got it got it thank you thank you vijay for clarifying that andreas we hope that helped for more questions just keep commenting in uh, wherever you're tuned in from and we're happy to flash them on screen with that hurry over to you i know you've got a ton of questions lined up for vijay Thanks, Adil. Uh, Vijay, some of the questions. The first one I'm, I'm going to ask you about, how do you scale your engineering teams, right? Like Lithium, Pi, N8. There's some of the engineering teams that are doing groundbreaking work. And, and as a company of around like 9,000 plus technologists, like what are the cha obstacles, challenges you faced while scaling your engineering teams? and also maintaining the level of innovation as well. Like it's both uh, as you try to scale the engineering team, you constantly hear about how things slows down and how it's not how it used to be earlier and so on. And, and how do you ensure the innovation is maintained as you scale the engineering team now at like 9,000 plus? What, are, what is the secret sauce there? <laughs> 
Uh, great question. Uh, well, I wish I, I wish I could share the secret sauce. <laughs> uh, I, anyways, I will. Right? It's it's not it's nothing. There's no magic here. I'll, I'll share what we've done. Uh, I'm sure mm -hmm. other companies have done this as well. And it's not a one and done deal, right? It's a constant challenge that, that you'll have to stay on top of. So as you said, uh, 9,000 plus close to 10,000 actually R&D. We are a, a truly global shop, right? So we, uh, even though we have a big presence in the US, a huge presence in the US, uh, we have R&D um, uh, folks out in, in Europe uh, several different countries. We have a, a sizable presence in Brazil. We have a huge presence in India. Uh, almost one third of the R&D is in India. So um, you'll have to remember that uh, we've been in business for quite some time. We're not a startup, right? So 70 years plus um, going strong. Uh, we we are we are taking this approach of traditionally ADP has been very good at service, right? So we are a good, we are the best at providing service. We, we come to you, we run your payroll and, and we provide that service for you. Now uh, our, our CEO has mandated us to, to slightly change that and say, become the best at creating excellent products combined with the same great level of uh, service, right? So we want our, we want to transform ourselves into being a product company, combined with that excellent service that uh, that we are known for, and and so that has been happening. That transformation has been happening last uh, three four uh, years or so, and as we start. Uh, um, scaling out across the globe. Uh, we've been constantly increasing our presence in India, in Brazil, all these places that I just talked about. Uh, and we've uh, uh, we've noticed uh, that we've also had to deal with some of the challenges that other companies that uh, typically scale at this level uh, go through. One thing that is first and foremost is, uh, in my mind, is having one strategy and one vision, which is simple enough for all 60,000 of us of ADP associates across the globe to understand, get behind and start pulling in one direction. And we are fortunate enough to have a great CEO and leadership team that have set that vision for us, right? And that strategy in ADP is called win as one. Uh, that means we are winning as one team, right? So even though we are global, we operate as one team and our goals are simply uh, categorized into three categories. We, whatever we do, all 60,000 of us, it has to follow or it has to like slot itself into these three buckets, right? So we are simplifying. And what we mean by this is we simplify how we do our jobs. We simplify how we provide service to our clients. We simplify our efforts and the processes that we, we undertake on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Simplify and take non-productive workout. We innovate. And so your question is right there in the strategy is, we're not just status quoing, or we're not just maintaining BAU. So innovate is as important as servicing our clients. So we constantly innovate, and and that's that's clearly defined in our strategy. And growing, and growing is growing our uh, our place in the market, like getting more clients and onboarding them onto these next gen innovative platforms that we're creating. So having that strategy and and having it simple enough where everybody understands it so that they can all pull in the same direction is, is really important and is fundamental. So that's something that we've done. And we've done some of the other technology related things. Now I'm focusing uh, from the ADP big picture down to like the technology picture. A and uh, we've done a few things, right? So, and we've been doing these uh, as part of our transformation. So we've now instituted triad model. So we have product management working with UX and the app dev teams. They're all collaborating together. They're innovating as one. Uh, and what this has done is helped uh, the product priorities and the tech priorities combine and collaborate with each other, but ultimately resulting in improved user experience, right? So for our clients, for our customers, whether internal or external. Right, those three going together, uh, that model is is has been put in place. And uh, as 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 you know, as you rightly pointed out, since we are a global team, getting everybody to align to the triad model took us some time, but we are now there, and and that's uh, helping us greatly in terms of our innovation. 
The other thing with big teams is uh, the the agility, as you rightly pointed out, Hari, is uh, how agile can your teams be? So even though we are global, we still operate in small teams. Uh, so uh, I think we borrowed a leaf out of the Amazon book. So we do uh, uh, tend to operate as two pizza teams uh, that are totally empowered. Uh, one of the things that our uh, CTO, uh, our CVP, Corporate Vice President for Global R&D, uh, has put in place is uh, uh, this motto called um, uh, build it, uh, run it, and own it, right? So mm -hmm. the teams are responsible for building. More importantly, we just had our uh, um, SRE engineers uh, come and, and co-locate with the R&D teams, with the app dev teams. So now you have one empowered uh, um singular unit that is not just building and throwing it over the fence for somebody else to either maintain and, and run it. Uh, but that team is now responsible for all of it, right? So end to end. Now that also uh, uh, was a journey, So, uh, but nothing that was too difficult to overcome. Uh, so that's a challenge that uh, uh, that we were able to overcome and, and is now uh, that, that operating model is now put in place. And um, I'd say finally, again, global teams, uh, there's always going to be a, a challenge in terms of the competitiveness of the job market that's local uh, to the global team, right? So uh, sometimes the market in India is extremely hard and, and maybe the market in the US is not uh, as hard uh, and so on and so forth. So we're constantly playing catch up to make sure we regain our talent. Uh, but that's a challenge that most uh, enterprise global companies have to deal with. Obviously, now the market is hot globally, so everybody <laughs> everywhere uh, is dealing with the challenge. But uh, yeah, that's some, those were some of the challenges that uh, we had to overcome uh, to scale our teams. But again, we had the benefit of being a global company, having presence in all of these areas, which helped uh, with the brand, with the awareness, with the attraction of the talent. All right, that that's a that, that lot of key takeaways from that, right? Starting with how it started with win as one and the whole corporate uh, company behind this. And as you're talking about it, you went into innovation as one, where you had the product UX and the app developers in. And I, I like the, the build it, run it, and own it model, uh, especially uh, more as developers build and then they own it and they get to see the impact of, okay, my code is helping so many people get productive and it's automated working, powering this chatbot. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a lot more impactful than, you know, you just building it and I don't know how many users are using it. I don't know the, the problems they are facing comes three, four level layer after to me. Uh, I love the, love the model there. Uh, um, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so probably the second question I, I do get uh, understand now uh, uh, some of the pieces for the question I'm going to answer. Uh, question I'm going to ask now. Uh, ADP has been named in the Fortune's magazine like world's most admired companies. The list for the last fourteen consecutive years, right? Like, uh, so what do you think some of the most important factors are that that led to this? Like, what are what are your your big reasons why you believe like this is why we are here uh, uh, so uh, this is a, a really interesting question and uh, i will tell you a story that uh one of my managers here mm -hmm. uh, i think this was a story he shared at a global town hall uh, i may be wrong with the dates because it was shared uh, uh, a few months ago but I think it's just testament to the kind of company that ADP is. So uh, I know there's a global audience watching this, so maybe not all of them will understand some of the terminology. But uh, so in the in 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 the U.S., uh, all employers are mandated to report their wage and tax information for all their employees, and and it's 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 a form that. Uh, they're supposed to send the employee and the employee uses it to file their taxes with the IRS. So it's an IRS form, right? So uh, I believe in the 70s, 1970s, uh, this form uh, was like a four part carbon copy form. I don't know <laughs> the age of the audience. Ari, you, you seem uh, pretty young as well. So I don't know if you guys know carbon copies. 
but back in my day, uh, you had these this like carbon copies. It's like a carbon paper, and then there's like two or three copies of paper underneath, and you write really hard or you type really hard, and then you you made impressions of that first form. And so that's what was in vogue uh, back in the day in the 70s, and and all the employers had to print, and it was just messy, right? So carbon paper, it can get messy. It's not legible all the time, but you had this huge infrastructure of maintaining it, and it was really bad experience for the employer, for the employees, for everybody, right? So, so what does uh, the, the CEO back then? Uh, his name was uh, Josh Weston, and, and so uh, Josh. Obviously, uh, we are in the payroll business, and and he's he's seen this, and so one day he said he is going to do something about it. So, uh, what do typical CEOs do when they notice a problem? They delegate, right? So they they call their team and say, "Hey, this is a problem. I need you to find a solution." That's not how things work at ADP. We roll up our sleeves, just like Josh. Uh, we we get inspiration right from the top. So Josh rolled up his sleeves. And he single-handedly redesigned the W2 form, right? So he redesigned he redesigned it into a one page, the the format that you everybody uses today. That's the format that Josh came up with. He redesigned it. He called his top lawyer in, uh, ADP's top lawyer, into the office, and he said, "Take this form, take it to the uh, IRS, and ask them to show you specifically where in the legislation it says." W-2 forms have to be four-part carbon copies, right? And he knew there is no such legislation. It was just that's how things were done, and that's what people were used to. So he was challenging status quo. So our lawyer goes in and he questions the IRS. They couldn't show any 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 law, any uh, uh, legal stipulation that said there it had to be a four-part carbon copy. And so our lawyer says. Well, thank you. This is the format that ADP is going to send uh, our W two starting this year. He leaves the office. He comes back, and that's what ADP did, right? So uh, we sent our W twos in the new format that was designed by our CEO, and uh, that's the format that's being used by every company in the U.S. today. So it's just the testament to the kind of company that ADP is. It's a testament and affirmation of the values uh, that our leadership has been instilling in our associates from not just today, not yesterday, not ten years ago, right from the beginning. Uh, it's a testament to the leadership that ADP brings, not just to uh, our company, but the industry and and in this case, the whole country, right? So um, that kind of transformation has been. Imbibed into our DNA, and and that's why employees love uh, working at our, uh, at ADP because we are constantly challenged, and and we are empowered to come up with creative problem solving techniques like this, and uh, we have opportunities to do that, and we are recognized for doing that. Thanks for sharing that, Vijay. That's an that's an amazing story. I I've never used carbon copy. I've seen my mom use that, and I never <laughs> like them because it makes your hands so messy. If you play with that for a while, and then then you got to go and watch, right? So it's certainly it's good to see how how big of a change it is, right? Like going and talking to IRS to say this is the format, uh, and and uh, the fact that uh, you mentioned that like the the CEO was. able to redesign and and do that it's the you know product focus ceo that's that's the current term now but it, that's that's what uh, it's been there from the start from adp it's, uh, thanks for sharing that that story absolutely um, the next one you mentioned you are not going to go deep dive on tech stack but this is one this is one question i like because i understand i love come to see what kind of a tech stack what is the latest tech stack companies use and and i learn a ton of valuable data from that so in adp uh, you know given the wide variety of products you have as well the tech stacks that engineers um and designers work with are some of the best in the market like you have spring boot you have react redux angular um so could you give us a sneak peek into 
how first like an overview of the technologies you use and also how it evolves into the earlier technologies to the latest technology right like there is the technology is evolving every, especially in the front end world i feel like every month there is a new javascript framework or something which keeps on coming up on and on uh, so how do you how do you know when to shift are there any pilot operations you have employee incentives with this uh, how do you keep your tech stack to the latest but also not really rewriting everything again and again and again because something cool came up yesterday and you know let's drop everything and rewrite everything in golang like how do you avoid that kind of scenario as well okay uh i'm just thinking so so uh, maybe i'll answer this question uh, as two parts right one big picture how do we foster innovation at adp especially in the tech space and then uh maybe tactical how do teams go about um mm -hmm. innovating and and figuring out what tech stack works for them and and how to and when to upgrade um uh, or rewrite right so so starting at the top uh we do have uh an internal um uh accelerator incubator whatever you want to call it at adp uh it's called adp labs uh that's where all our cool uh tech stuff uh, uh happens and um that's where uh most of our products most of our next gen products get birth um uh, that's where they're born um so uh i think i talked about roll uh, by adp so uh that's a product that just uh came out of adp labs so they incubate they build and then they 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 transition usually to um uh, dev teams to to scale and support and onboard and and build your marketplace right so um that's where innovation happens so they are constantly so there's this team that's constantly uh, not just looking to innovate on technology but leveraging how do you leverage technology to solve a real problem uh so so we are we are i guess left hand and right hand talking to each other in terms of leveraging new aspects in technology to solve real problems uh that that are plaguing both adp as well as our clients uh so so that's the incubator uh, there's other pro uh, um products that came out of the lab uh, very successful huge multi million dollar products that are that are uh, operational now i think you guys have heard of adp marketplace adp mobile uh, all of these were things that were started as next gen technology ventures or products and then they graduate from the lab and then they get uh ga uh, acceptance uh across the entire the landscape as well as within adp itself so that's the big picture mm -hmm. uh innovation that happens uh we also have a couple other uh, there's several i'm i'm just going to maybe in the interest of time just go over uh, maybe one or two uh so we have definitely events that foster uh innovation both technology uh, again all outcome based so we just finished our global hackathon event uh more, several thousand associates participated it's it's truly a two day global event uh that was um conducted there are some very interesting ideas uh that were uh selected or shortlisted and uh, there was there was a team uh that won the global hackathon and uh uh they have now gotten like seed money to kind of take that and 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 move it on uh and see if uh, it can be productized so so there's encouragement that way where um ideas coming out of global hackathons uh have a way of getting productized uh then there's um uh, uh forums like uh in india we just when during my time there we launched um uh, an innovation program called india adp india sandbox and the whole idea there was um every quarter see there's 10000 people adp associates in india right so out of that is roughly about 3500 r&d and the rest are service finance hr so there's many coas that run out of india and uh, i think it's a great opportunity to get 10000 minds to collaborate with each other and come up with innovative ways of uh, solving specific problems plaguing our customers and so we launched this program and the idea is uh once a quarter we hold 
like a Shark Tank like event, and it's judged by the uh, the senior leadership team in India, and uh, and a team has to come in and uh, present. So so they would submit their ideas, which would be shortlisted, and and the top five would be picked for that quarter. They come in and they pitch their idea, and if the the sharks like any of these ideas, then they invest like virtual money, uh, really sponsorship is what they're investing. And and once a team is uh, ha- has the buy-in from the sharks, then they would get the the sponsorship to to go ahead and and innovate on those ideas, right? So it's just a, a forum and a vehicle to foster collaboration as well as innovation. And finally, the last part is like getting down to the the nitty gritty of the product itself. Um, the the go to market strategy has to look at um, uh, how things are deployed out to customers, right? So um, before we innovate, whether it's, uh, there's several ways we gather feedback. Uh, there's tools like Pendo, I'm sure you guys are using as well. There's other early adopter programs we have in place with our customers where we gather feedback and and, and that's the, the first group to receive any product update. We work with them for a few weeks uh, for, to a few months and gather the feedback and then revamp and, and, and improve the product and before we actually roll it out. So there's many ways where innovation happens, both technology as well as like product features. And uh, it's a complex ecosystem, right? I don't think there's a one size fits all model uh, that, that can work across the globe, especially for an enterprise company like this. All right, all right. Thanks for sharing that. That that seems to be like a multifaceted approach. You have everything starting from your labs to the uh, to the Shark Tank uh, approach. Um, so in these in these events, do people build things related to ADP? Is there something it could be completely out? What what what, what have you seen so far? So the labs obviously uh, they're they're ADP related. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so the landscape has to be relevant to uh, the business we are in, mm-hmm. but uh, the the sandbox uh, mm-hmm. no holds barred. Uh, mm-hmm. So um, there's some really interesting ideas that have uh, come up, um, mm-hmm. uh, leveraging AI, ML, uh, conversational AI ideas have come out. Mm-hmm. Machine learning. Uh, there, there, somebody has come up with a, a way of solving for automatic machine translation because ADP again operates across the globe, and, and we need that. And, and I think there's some really cool ideas. Uh, uh, but uh, this again was recently started, so uh, mm-hmm. I, I have a lot of hope for things to come out in the future. Got it. Got it. Uh, Atil, I have more questions, but you flashed some from the, the users. So do you want to? Uh, uh, us to take that before I move on to the next one. Yeah, I think that'll be very helpful. Uh, the first one is from Matt Roman, and Matt asks, "What challenges do you have with coordinating dependencies between federated teams versus platform teams?" The whole point of federation is to give them the flexibility and the ability uh, uh, to to innovate and develop on the platform, right? So the only challenge is coordination when the platform itself is undergoing uh, either enhancements or changes. Uh, uh, so, so we have a, 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 a process in place to ensure any release uh, updates are being communicated across uh, our globally federated teams. So teams are aware and, and can ensure and account for, uh, but if they're just building out uh, and any platform change is obviously uh, retroactive, so we go back and support uh, previous versions before we deprecate anything. Uh, like there's no hard deprecation, right? So, uh, so from that perspective, the the only coordination between the platform and the federation teams is to ensure any changes to the platform are coordinated and 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 communicated in well in advance, so the federated teams can account for um, those changes within their release schedules. All right, and the next one, thank you, Matt, for that question. Uh, we hope that helped. The next one is from Subhashish, and Subhashish says, given the fact that ADP is into payroll business for years, there would be legacy as well as monolith apps and services. What is the strategy of choosing legacy or monolith apps to be migrated to microservice? Right, so it's not, uh, it's uh, it's a great question. Thank you, Subhashish. Uh, I don't think it's a straightforward answer, so uh, unfortunately. So 
there's there's never uh, like a playbook for these things, right? So you have to it, it's 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 subjective to the kind of legacy applications you have, to the kind of market that you have for these legacy applications, to where you feel the market may be moving or shifting. And so these sorts of things kind of dictate which ones you pick and choose. And it's always not a migration, right? So, so it's not a lift and shift strategy. Sometimes you just have to go for uh, leaving things where they are and building from the ground up. And I'll give you a good example. So uh, AD, I think you rightly said ADP is in the payroll business for several years. Uh, so the market kind of dictates, and this is true for every company, right? So your market dictates the kind of products you build and the kind of services you offer to your clients. So the payroll market, whether you've realized it or not, if you're in the traditional, like in the employer-employee relationship, you may not notice this as much, but the pay market has been shifting pretty dramatically in the last few years. Like with the advent of companies like Uber, and I think if I were to use the India landscape, Ola and, and all these ride-sharing uh, uh, companies, as well as um, there's now companies that offer gigs, like the whole gig marketplace or the gig economy where you know, you're not an employee, employer, you don't have that relationship. They have gigs, you come in as a contractor, you perform the gig, and then once you're done, you expect to get paid, right? So your traditional payroll business is, I have my payroll calendar defined and I'm going to pay you either at the end of the month, so once a month payroll or bi-weekly payroll. And if I don't do that, then I am forced to do something called off-cycle pay, which is, which is complex and is expensive. And, and now companies have to kind of support that, but more importantly, support or cater towards real-time pay, right? So people expect even employer-employee relationships, some, especially the Gen Xers and, and some of the really young folks, they're expecting to get paid when they want it, not when the company wants to pay them, right? So so, so you can't take really a, a legacy monolith app and move it into AWS or move it into your BPC or any of the public clouds available out there and expect it to automatically solve this problem, right? So in some cases, you have to start from scratch and, and build something that accounts uh, or lends itself to solving this sort of problem, which is exactly what we've been doing. We have our next-gen payroll engine, and uh, this is already winning some awards again. Uh, nobody can innovate a payroll like ADP can. And uh, so our next gen payroll engine is called Pi. And uh, and all it does is real time pay. So the employer uh, and the employee doesn't really uh, uh, impact pay, uh, sorry, impact Pi. Anybody can go in and request that they get paid whenever they want to get paid. And Pi can process and do the direct deposit into the employer's account. Right, so this is the sort of innovation uh, and capabilities that that we focus on when we look at legacy applications and say, does it make sense to either lift and shift or break it down and rebuild kind of similar functionality, but in a more modern tech stack, or does it make sense to just leave it there and then start from scratch and build something that nobody else in the market uh, can can offer? Right, thanks for that. Uh, Adil, I'm going to take on the next question uh, before one more comes in. Uh, because Vijay mentioned about the awards the, the product has been received, he's received, and, and uh, that reminds me of the data cloud, right? Like ADP's data cloud, you know, won 2020's AI uh, Breakthrough Award, and the best AI based solution for data science category. Uh, first of congrats for that. Um, can you can you tell us what helped Data Cloud stand out in the competition, and how do you think organizations should utilize the power of AI uh, in the products like you have? Like, what what is the strategy there? Uh, sure. So so Data Cloud uh, obviously has been doing really well for ADP, uh, and and the market is now recognizing that as well with your words. So the one thing I can tell you is um, 
ADP has access to, again, uh, more than like 750,000 companies' data. We process payroll for a lot of companies, right? So we have access to a lot of data that other companies just don't. That they don't have access to this data. But more importantly, having access to that data, uh, more important than that is what do you do with that data, right? So what this team has done is... Um, come up with innovative ways, I think I talked about this uh, when we opened this, is how do you mine meaningful and insightful information that can be served up in a timely manner as well, right? So if the information, as, as good as it is, the insight, as good as it is, if you don't give it to me at the right time, it is useless to me, right? So the power of ADP Data Cloud is taking data from such a huge uh, uh, mine of data and, and taking it and mining in insights out of it and serving those insights. Uh, and I just want to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, make a clarification that all this data uh, will always, whenever I say this, uh, please assume this, but I'm just going to call it out explicitly. We always uh, aggregate this data. We always anonymize this data. So data privacy, data security, that's something that we take absolutely at the highest levels uh, 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 of commitment. Uh, and so we pay very close attention to all of that. So none of this data is, again, uh, uh, outside of anything that I just talked about, right? So once it goes through that process, we mine the information and we present those insights directly into the applications themselves, right? So we figured out a way to embed real-time intelligence as part of your application workflow. You don't need to call a separate report. You don't need to leave your application and go out someplace for uh, these insights. So as you come in, so uh, so one of the things that Data Cloud did was this thing called executive insights, right? So as you go into your application, your HR application as a manager, when you log in, it shows you right within whichever application you are using, we can surface that information through APIs, uh, who your top performers are, or uh, like I said, uh, where is the risk of uh, uh, your maybe your high-performing employees leaving compared to the uh, the market? How are you paying them compared to the market? Uh, what is your quality of hire uh, when you onboard somebody? Are you really onboarding quality people into your company? These sorts of insights are both timely and relevant, but they're served embedded within your traditional workflows with wherever, whichever HCR, sorry, HCM application they use, right? So I think that's the power where information is being served right as they go about their day-to-day -day business. And I think that's what's being recognized. There's a whole bunch of other capabilities. I, I think we're at the top of the hour um, that are being introduced into uh, Data Cloud. One of, one of the things that I'll just call out is this concept called storyboarding. So instead of throwing out a graph or uh, uh, some metric we give you a storyboard, which means we'll, it's, there's plain English um, NLP where, uh, 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 and, and, and natural language generation where it takes the, the metric and it translates that into plain English for whoever the audience is, right? So those sorts of things are innovative uh, uh, improvements happening within the cloud. Thank you for that, uh, Vijay. Yeah, Adil, go ahead, over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you for that, Vijay. That was fascinating. I'm I'm really surprised. We're already at the top of the hour. I just kept on listening, kept on taking notes. I'm sure Hari was enjoying the conversation as well. So are all of our uh, viewers from across the world. So thank you, Vijay, for this fascinating session. Thank you, everyone who tuned in from the Americas, from Europe, from Middle East, from APAC, from India. All of you, thank you so much for joining in. We're delighted that you joined us today. Vijay, thank you very much for a great session. All of, all of us, let's stay safe. Let's beat the coronavirus and hopefully go back to the older ways of doing work. I'm sure a lot of us are enjoying the remote work. Uh, so am I. We are embracing the remote life. But you know, I, I'm really looking forward to the day when we'll go back to offices and meet all of us in person. But until then, until then we'll keep bringing you to, uh, these live streams. We really hope you enjoy them and uh, look forward to staying connected. So Vijay, with that, uh, Hari, that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate okay. it.